Okay. So, this uh, morning we will continue with uh, representation of numbers. Let me just uh, get back to where we were, what we did in the last class. We saw that computational fluid dynamics that we are going to solve equations, differential equations that come from fluid mechanics. The solutions to such equations are functions and uh, uh, these functions in order for us to be able to solve these equations, both the differential equations and the functions have to be represented on a computer, that is the, the idea. So, to that end, we decided to represent uh, uh, various mathematical entities on a computer. We started the way that you have learnt calculus that we started by saying that let us try to represent the real line on the computer. And uh, what we have basically done now is uh, we have tried fixed point, we have done integers, we have finally come down to floating point. I have asked you to look up IEEE uh, 754 standard. I gave you what is used for, uh, what is the format that is used for single precision, single precision or a float or uh, uh, in fact I asked you to look up this file on your computer, locate where it is and look up this file on your computer. And just to recollect for uh, a float or I have used the word now single precision. as opposed to double precision, right. So, we have uh, indicated that the first bit was the sign bit. We used the next 8 bits 1 through 8, we used them for the exponent. Again I remind you that please go look up big endian and little endian. Then the remaining how many are there? 23 bits going from 9 numbered till 31. Please remember we started the count at 0. The remaining bits are typically used for the mantissa. It is possible that uh, if you come across something called an AN, not a number, you will see that maybe there are 22 bits and you look at look up the standard and you will find out about it, but I am not going to really uh, talk about this now. So, we have 23 bits which are the mantissa. To this end, I had asked you to try out an experiment which I hope that you guys have tried, which is to ask the question is there a positive, what is the smallest positive epsilon, epsilon, smallest positive number such that, that is epsilon, 1 plus epsilon, smallest positive number such that. 1 plus epsilon is different from 1, okay. I had also said that oh there is an alternate definition, you can also look for the largest positive number such that 1 plus epsilon equals 1, is that fine? So that is a possibility. So we had written a piece of code for uh, pseudo code for this, I had asked you to try this out. So, you let epsilon, epsilon, in fact I think uh, yesterday I had used a different symbol for this, I had used that, okay. Epsilon equals 1 as a start and you can say while 1 plus epsilon, this is a candidate epsilon is greater than 1, so it is not equal to 1 or you can also say not equal to 1. Divide epsilon by 2. This is something that I suggest that you do, try it out. I know if you have tried it out, you will see that you will have a variety of experiences that uh, you guys would have had. Some of you possibly for float uh, double and long double, right. You may have got uh, different answers for these, but depending on uh, your experience, some of you may have got the same answer for both of them. So, you have to ponder why the epsilon sometimes uh, comes out the same for both of these and what does it mean with respect to what is the accuracy with which we can calculate, make our calculations. Is that fine? Okay. So, this is single precision. You try to relate this 
to the size of the mantissa that we have. So that is what we are really measuring here when we do this epsilon. What we are essentially doing is we are asking the question with respect to 1 what can we resolve and what we can resolve is given by the size of the mantissa. So you please check the epsilon that you get and compare it to 2 raised to the power minus 24 and I have explained to you why it is 24 yesterday and see what is the relationship between, between what you printed out and what you have got here. Right. So what about where, what, what, what is what's the next deal? So before I go on with the discussion since I have got that up there let me just tell you that there is a uh, double which uses 64 bits. This is double precision in Fortran or real star 8 depending on what you are used to. I usually say real star 8, double precision is much longer to type. So we would like, I mean we would have liked it if the 32 bits that you added here had been added directly to the mantissa. Unfortunately that is not happened. So what happens in this standard is that you have the sign bit just like, just like you had in the single precision and 11 bits, 11 bits 1 through 11 are set aside for the exponent, okay. And the remaining how many would that be 52 bits, the remaining 52 bits 12 to 63 are set aside for the mantissa. So this would be double precision, is that fine? Okay, so now that I have told you this, let us step back and ask ourselves the question, if we are performing computations using single precision or double precision and associated with it there is an epsilon, what are we actually doing? What is the computation that we are actually performing? So let us go back to the real line that we had yesterday and zoom in on around 1. What is it that we are actually doing? So this is 0, 0.0, this is 1.0. Well, in fact, I would not indicate 0, 0.0. 0, 0.0 is somewhere there, right? I mean, it is far off. I am going to really zoom in. And this is basically epsilon, right? So this is minus epsilon, 1 minus epsilon, and this is 1 plus epsilon. And what we are essentially saying here is any number in this, any number here, right, basically maps into 1. That is essentially what we are saying. That is if you give me an epsilon, if you give me a sufficient epsilon, so if epsilon sufficiently small, any number that would actually fit in here ends up being, ends up being 1. That is essentially what it says that when you say 1 plus epsilon is 1, what you are effectively saying is you give me this epsilon and it is going to turn out that when I add it to 1, I am still going to get 1. So any epsilon, this neighborhood is actually, it is like a mush factor that I have, mush area that I have here. The 1.0 that I 1.0 that I use on the computer, as opposed to one that I use when I uh, talk mathematics, the 1.0 that I'm talking about here, actually represents an interval. This represents this chalk dust represents the idea of one. This chalk dust here represents a whole interval, one minus epsilon to one plus epsilon. So when we are adding, when we are adding two numbers together, that is, when we add, uh, say, 2.0 to 1.0 plus 1.0. Actually what you are doing is you are adding two intervals. There is an interval associated with this number 2, there is an interval associated with this number 1 and we are actually adding these two numbers together. Is that fine? So basically the arithmetic that we are doing is not the standard mathematical arithmetic that we do but uh, uh, what I would say is the interval arithmetic. There is a lot of interest in this interval arithmetic. arithmetic. So you have to ask the question if you have a comma b plus c comma d, what would that turn out to be? If you had a comma b plus c comma d, what would that turn out to be? So a comma b plus c comma d will turn out to be a plus c comma b plus d. In a similar fashion, in a similar fashion, if I were going to go with the subtraction instead of addition. So you try these operations, mathematical operations, please try the operations minus multiplication and division with intervals instead of actual numbers and that gives you an idea as to what, what is the nature of the arithmetic that we are doing. 
so if you say that I have uh, uh, if I have 1.0 you now have an uncertainty as to actually what the original number was you do not know whether it was 1 or it was something else that became 1. So we now introduce for the first time an error associated with uh, an error associated with we now introduce for the first time an error, error associated with this representation. I will call the general error since we are talking about representations on a computer we will call the general error representation error okay. The representation error is the difference between a mathematical entity and its representation on the computer okay. So that is a very general expression. So if you have any mathematical entity and you want to represent it on the computer the difference between the mathematical entity and its representation on the computer would be representation error. So in this case if you had some number that was actually of the order of 1 plus epsilon it would be represented by 1 that is what we are saying it would be represented by 1 and the error that you have is of the order of epsilon is in fact epsilon in this case if it were 1 plus epsilon. So this error for numbers is called round off error. So it is a particular type of it is a particular type of uh, representation error called round off error okay. So round off error is a, is a problem that we have. So now first so we know when I say that I am representing numbers I am actually representing intervals that when I uh, when I perform arithmetic I am actually doing arithmetic of intervals and if I say that I add two numbers a plus b to c plus d it is very likely that the result is actually more uncertain possible more uncertain than what we started off with. So there is this uncertainty associated with these numbers that we have and if I just take a number just represent the number then there is an error associated with it which is the round off error and in the last class I already indicated that on a binary system uh, even 1 by 10 even 1 by 10 is, uh, is recurring right. So 1 by 10 because 1 by 2 though it can be represented exactly 1 by 10 has a problem because 1 fifth is a recurring number and if you truncate it to 23 bits in the mantissa then somewhere along the line you are going to chop the end off. So you are going to end up with what is called round off error. So I hope that is quite clear. So we, we have this thing now. So we have known that we cannot represent the real line exactly and we know that uh, uh, we have made a selection of what are the points on the real line that we are going to we are going to represent. However, it seems that associated with that decision there is associated a there, there is a there is a connected round off error and we have to deal with that connected round off error okay fine. So this is as far as uh, representing numbers goes on the computer let us see what else we can do what are the mathematical entities are we interested in we are interested in vectors for instance. So if you want to represent vectors okay as I said I am not going to say much about uh, uh, computer architecture and so on however it is important for us to know that computer memory in our mind the model that we have of computer memory is linear that is that is in you have the 0th location of memory first location second location third location it is it is computer memory occurs in a linear fashion it comes one after the other in a linear fashion. So if I wanted to store a vector uh, uh, vectors and matrices of course is what I told you that I would do at the uh, in the beginning uh, of yesterday's class but however vectors and matrices have associated with them various operations and properties. In reality what I am going to do is I am going to represent arrays I will call them arrays just to distinguish from uh, vectors and matrices right. So though I promised vectors and matrices what I am actually going to give you is an array and when I say a vector what I mean is a one dimensional array. So one dimensional array AI has one subscript right so I do not care whether it is a column or a row here right now but because memory is linear what I will do is I will represent I will store right. So in, on the computer we will store or your compiler will store the arrangement is made automatically. So if there are n of these since I am using the C notation of starting the count at 0 a0 through an minus 1 will be stored in the computer memory linearly one after the other is that fine. So that is a quick way of doing uh, that is a quick way of doing vectors 
right so but as i said there are there is an algebra associated with it which has to be done by you i mean it's not going to be something that's done automatically on most computers okay what about two dimensional arrays okay so you wanted matrices but i will talk about 2d arrays so how do we do 2d arrays 2d arrays have two subscripts so they have a i will say i comma j just for or if you want a i comma j right so in a matrix that would be row comma column and the way you would store it is you would store it uh, either row wise or column wise in the linear memory what i mean by that is you would store a0 0 a01 say i'm storing that's the first row second column and so on till a is 0 n minus 1 and then go on to the next row which is a1 0 a11 and so on so the idea is that in a linear fashion i will store the first row then i will store the second row and then i'll go ahead and store the third row so the model that we have of the of the uh, uh, computer memory is linear and what we will basically do is i will store uh, the individual uh, rows one after the other this process this is how arrays in uh, c for example lot of languages are stored this process is called a row major this is a that's a standard and as as one can see if you can store it uh, row wise you can also store it uh, column wise so if you store it instead of uh, the first first row as we are done here and then go on to the second row instead of which if you do the first column and then go on to the second column you would get a column major operation is that fine so that would be something like a0 0 a10 and you will notice so the column is kept fixed a20 and so on till you got to a n minus 1 0 and then you go to the next next column right a01 then you go to the next column and then you sweep through the next column you uh, go column by column this is called column major the responsibility to implement either uh, matrix algebra or vector algebra uh, either lies with you or somebody else has done it in the form of a library and you should necessarily use those libraries if you want the associated algebra right so what we have shown now is uh, integers fixed point floating point floating point of various uh, 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 resolutions so to speak then we have uh, arrays vectors supposedly then uh, we have uh, matrices or 2D arrays. If you have the associated algebra, you can do matrix algebra. So the only thing that we have now is uh, we have to look at functions and how functions can be represented if possible. That is the deal. Okay. I am going to put up a bunch of things now. You please see what they have, what they have in common. Okay. So I write a bunch of things, 3x squared plus 1. 3, oh well, I will put this up right up front, 3i plus 2j plus k, 3 cos theta plus 2 sin theta plus 1, 3 plus 2 plus 1, what else can I add, 321, 3 comma 2 comma 1 and just for the fun of it, 3dx plus 2 dy plus dz right or even 3 dou by dou x well, I am not going to really talk about these but I am just doing it just for the fun of it so that you get an idea as to okay so what do all these expressions have in common what is the what is it that they have in common what is different so you can look at this and you say oh that is a polynomial this seems to be a vector right and this is possibly terms in a Fourier series I do not know that is maybe a clue this is just the addition I mean that is 6 so the if you pay attention to this except for this in all of these in all of these uh, expressions that I have written here you would think that I am cra quite crazy if I actually added the 3 to the 2 so if you ask the question ask yourself the question what role does the I here play uh, your mathematics background will tell you oh the I is a unit vector that is along the x axis and so on but in 
reality if you ask the question here at this expression, this expression you would add the 3 to 2. In this expression you do not add the 3 to 2 simply because the i and j are there. So the i, j, k here sort of prevent you from adding the 3 to the 2 and that role is played as well by 3, 2, 1. So in that sense these are quite similar, right. I mean if I take, if I take uh, the combination, if I take the combination 3x squared plus 2x plus 1 and I add to that 5x squared plus 3x plus 2, that really is no different from 3i plus 2j plus k and make sure I get the same numbers 5i plus 3j plus 2k. So if I add these up, indeed I add these respective components here, so I will get 8x squared plus 5x plus 3 whereas here I get 8i plus 5j plus uh, 3k. What is the difference? There is no difference, right. So basically the, the summation seems to work just the same as this. So this looks like just like this is some point in 3 dimensions, you would easily identify this as a point in 3 dimensions. This looks like similar to a point in 3 dimensions. So it looks like we can actually represent a function, deal with the function as though it is a point in space. Is that fine? So we can deal with this function as though it were a point in space. Of course, I should point out that if x were equal to 1, coming back here, if x were equal to 1, then indeed you will get 3 plus 2 plus 1. And if x were equal to 10, you would actually get 321. So there is a connection between these two, there is a reason why I have written this. I have already mentioned Fourier series and you can as I said think about this and what it means, whether it makes any sense to you. It is not something that I want to get into right now, but I have just, I thought I would just throw that out there. If you had a uh, course in differential equations or linear algebra, it may, it may make more sense to you. Okay. So now we have a big thing. What it basically says is that by representing taking a, an array, see this is a one dimensional array, this is a big deal that we have done here, this is a one dimensional array. So I can use this one dimensional array to represent this vector or to represent this function or to represent that function. So that is the, that is the great thing that we have achieved here. So it is a simple comparison but what it tells me is that it is possible for me to assemble various components, right. And uh, it also looks like that if I take a function now, it is, uh, it is actually a point in some kind of a space, some kind of a function space. So we are dealing with computers and of course even if we were to do the manipulation ourselves, one of the things that we would like to do is we would like to organize any space that we have in a systematic fashion so that we can do searches, comparisons and so on, okay. So that is that's where we are headed, that is that is our objective. So let me then uh, uh, show you some systematic way by which we do it. Since I have started off with vector algebra, I will show you how we do it with vector algebra and then maybe in the next class it is possible we will, we will start off with uh, functions and how to represent functions. Is that fine? Okay. So how do we do vector algebra? Where does it start? So how, what was the definition of a vector that, uh, the earliest definition of a vector that you have seen? The earliest definition of a vector that you have seen is most likely a directed line segment. So if I have a vector A, you most probably saw this vector A as a directed line segment. So the arrowhead indicates the direction. The length of the line typically indicates uh, the, vector, the magnitude of the vector. So it is a very geometrical definition. So if I have two directed line segments A and B, then we have defined the sum of A and B using what you know already as the parallelogram law. So the resultant R r equals a plus b is given by the parallelogram law, is that fine? Okay, so that is all very nice, we can do the geometry but the whole point is to get to some kind of an algebra so that we can do the manipulation on paper rather than drawing figures and we will see how we do this, then we can get to manipulating things on the computer so that we do not have to draw figures, that is the idea. Okay, so how do we get there? There is another critical thing that we define which is the dot product. A dot B, if you go back to your, if you go back to your, 
vector algebra the first time that you learnt it is magnitude A and this is the definition magnitude B cosine of the included angle cosine of theta that angle is theta okay that angle is theta and incidentally this is equal to B dot A if you just look at this multiplication oops sorry about that B dot A okay so A dot B is the same as B dot A. How does this help? What does this give us? Well this does something really neat. The first thing that I can do is I can say that I can ask the question what is A dot A? Well A dot A is magnitude A into magnitude A cos of 0, the angle between A and itself which is magnitude A square. Okay. So this is neat. Now what we basically have is an expression for magnitude A which is A dot A square root, right. So previously we were measuring lengths, at some point you will actually have to measure lengths or you have to get that magnitude somehow but right now as long as you have the chalk dust you say it is A then the magnitude of A, right that is the algebra part is, is given by square, uh, square root of A dot A, fine. And as a consequence, there are neat things that you can do. You can define a unit vector and I will use the caret to indicate that it is a unit vector as A divided by magnitude A, right. And as a consequence, you can have something called a unit vector that is along A but has magnitude 1, right. So clearly the mag magnitude of the unit vector, magnitude of A equals 1, is that fine, okay. So what have we got so far? So using this dot product, let us try to interpret what is A dot B. What happens if I take A dot B hat, where B hat is the unit vector along B? Well that is magnitude A, magnitude B, cos of theta. This is all a repetition of stuff that you guys know. So which is magnitude A cos theta, which is nothing but the projection of A onto B. Right? So this is a geometrical interpretation that you are aware of but what I really want to do and this is, this is the great thing is if I, can, if I can start off with R equals A plus B, I get R from A and B, is it possibly, possible for me given R to, to write them in terms, to write R in terms of A and B, can I decompose it into A and B, is it possible for me to decompose it into components, right just like we have done here. And as I said, this is a rerun of all the vector algebra that you know. I am going through this process simply because I propose to repeat this process for functions. So you just bear with, bear with me for that. So the question is if I have R or if I have a P, if I have R, so is it possible for me to write R as some uh, R sub A, I was going to choose alpha but R sub A, A plus R sub B. B. So this is the component of along A and this is the component along B, fine. Or is it possible for me to write it in terms of unit vectors, note the case, this is lower case R A A plus R B B. So I will start with the second case first because that is a little easier, right. So what, would, what do we do? Well the only operations that we have are vector sums and dot product and we have defined the dot product, it is very clear that you can take the dot product here. So let us take the dot product of R and A. So R dot A gives me R A, A dot A plus R B, B dot A, right. And uh, R dot B, if I take the dot product with B, gives me R B, B dot B uh, plus uh, I am sorry, I am going mad, R A, A dot B plus R B, B dot B, lots of Bs, B dot A, okay. So for those of you who have had fluid mechanics with me, you will recognize A dot A, B dot A, A dot B, B dot B as the metric tensor, for the rest of you it does not really matter. So basically what we have had here is, what you have is if a dot A is a unit vector, this becomes 1. If uh, this, they are unit vectors but we do not know what is the angle between them, so you are left with this. So in fact R dot A 
this can be rewritten as R A plus R B times B dot A and please remember B dot A and A dot B are the same, right? We have just set that as part of the definition. So, this is R A times A dot B or B dot A, it does not matter plus R B, fine. So, what we have is we have a system of equations that we need to solve for R A and R B and once you solve that system of equations, presumably we can go back and do this representation, okay. So, that, that looks like a neat possibility, but of course, you know that there is one condition where A and B, A dot B or B dot A is 0 and that is when they are orthogonal to each other. So, if A and B are orthogonal to each other, if you go back to the definition, I will write if A is orthogonal to B and in fact, they are orthonormal if A is orthogonal to B, A dot B equals 0, right, okay. So, that, that gives me R A, R dot A is R A and R dot B is R B which of course tells you why we spend so much time trying to get an orthogonal coordinate system. As you get along in CFD, you will see that it is done very often. We desperately try to get orthogonal coordinate systems. So, that is fine. So, you have a situation here where A and B are orthogonal. So, it is R A and R B, fine. What if they are not orthogonal? What if the initial set is not orthogonal? So, if we constrain ourselves to the board and somebody gives us two A's and B's, which are in this fashion, they are not orthogonal to each other. That is you take A dot B and you discover that A dot B is not orthogonal, is not 0, meaning that A dot B are not orthogonal, A and B are not orthogonal. How, what do we do, right? So, clearly they of course, they cannot be, they, you do not want them to be collinear, but if they are not orthogonal, then you will see why you do not want them to be collinear. What you can do is, you can choose the first vector, right. So, we can use p's if you want. So, I will use p hat 1, right. This is the first vector. This vector is going to form the basis for my representation, right. So, I want to look for an orthogonal basis. So, there when a and b are orthogonal, a and b form an orthogonal basis. I want to try to get an orthogonal basis from here. So, I will set P1 hat to in fact A by mod A. You may be wondering why did not I just choose A hat, but I will show you why, okay. What do we do now? So, how do I get, if B is not orthogonal to A, how do I get something that is orthogonal to, how do I get something that is orthogonal to uh, P1 hat? So, what I need to do is from B, I need to take out the component that is along A. So, if I find if I had find uh, b dot p1, the question is what is b dot p1? b dot p1 is the component along p1 of b. This multiplied by p1 gives me the component basically in vector form. In fact, this would be the component along p1, right. So, this is, this is uh, the vector along p1 which is the part of B that is along P1 and if I subtract from B, if I subtract this out, right, I knock this part out, what I am left with is, what I am left with is a P2 and this is a vector, right, not a unit vector, the vector. So, the question is what is P2 dot P1? If you look at P2 dot P1, P2 dot P1 gives me from here, just take a look, P2 dot P1 gives me B dot P1 minus B dot P1, P1 dot P1 which is 1 and lo and behold these two will cancel giving me that P2 is in fact orthogonal to P1 hat. Therefore, my P2 hat is nothing but P2 divided by magnitude of P2, is that fine? Okay, so, now given A and B that were not orthogonal to start with, what we have managed to do is find the P1 hat and P2 hat that are orthogonal to each other and from here on we can ask the question given an R, is it possible for us to find 
and R1 along P1 plus R2 along P2 so that R1 P1 plus R2 P2 equals R, the vector R. Is that okay? Right. So I think uh, what what we have done right now is we have we have come up with a mechanism by which we are able to generate this in two dimensions. What do we do in three dimensions? What if I had what if I had one more dimension? Right. What if I had a C that was not in the plane uh, made up of A and B? That's not in the plane of the backboard blackboard, but C actually comes out of the blackboard. So what do, what do, what is it that we do in that case? So and it is not orthogonal to the blackboard, right. So what, what I had was I had an A, just again I have a B, A, I have a B, they are clearly not perpendicular to each other and I have a C that is not orthogonal to the blackboard but that is at an angle. So what is it that I am going to do in this case? So I have already, I have, I have got my P1 hat, I have got my P2 hat. So from C, I need to find out that component of C that is along P2 and find out that component of C that is along P1 and subtract them out. So it is the same process. So I can take C dot P1 hat plus C dot P2 hat. So this would be that part of C that is in the plane, see. So if I have, if I have a vector that is sticking out of the board then C dot P1 hat and C dot P2 hat is this shadow that is cast on the board, right. So this is the perpendicular part component that is on the board. So this combination, right, if we call it P3, did I call it P3 last time? What did I call it? I did not call it anything, okay. So I will not call it anything, fine. I do not want to make a mistake, okay. And if I subtract this combination out of C, I will call this result P3. And we have to ask ourselves the question, what is P3 dot P1 hat and what is P3 dot P2 hat, okay. And bear in mind that P1 hat and P2 hat are orthogonal to each other. So clearly, if you go through this process, I will let you do it for yourself. Clearly, P1 hat and P2 hat are uh, orthogonal to P3. And from P3 now we can come up with a P3 hat which is P3 divided by modulus of P3, fine. And you also understand why it is that I have actually come up with uh, numbers instead of uh, alphabets. So it is actually possible for us that if you have multiple dimensions, right, they are not restricted to the three physical dimensions that we are talking about. But if you have n multiple dimensions, it is actually possible for us now to systematically go through each one to get an orthogonal set. This is not uh, really numerically, if you are dealing with actual vectors, a great way to do it. But this is called the Gram-Schmidt process. This is a, uh, Gram-Schmidt process, process, it is called the Gram-Schmidt process. And as I said, so it does not matter, it is not restricted to two dimensions or three dimensions. You can go to as many dimensions as you want. So clearly if you go to the fourth one, then you would knock out the components that would correspond to the first three and uh, that results in a, uh, that results in something that is orthogonal to each one of them. So it is a, it is a neat process. So this now leads us uh, to a situation where we are able to, um, what should I say? We are able to construct vectors of any kind. So if you want, uh, excuse me, if you want, if you want, uh, what should I say? Um, uh, so if you want something like 3x squared plus 2x plus 1 that we had earlier and we have 3i plus 2j plus k, we just need to ask ourselves the question, well I have got, I know how I have done it here, how is it that we are going to go about doing it here, okay. So this systematic organization now, I am going to uh, do it uh, uh, for functions. We will go through a series of, uh, series of uh, 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 class of functions 
uh, next class I will basically start with uh, box functions. So, what I will do here is I will uh, I will uh, stop at this point and uh, get back to box functions and so on. So, okay. So, in the next class what we will do is we will try to represent these functions as a uh, uh, we show representations of these functions of various kinds and what is the relevant accuracy that goes with them. Okay, thank you.